Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight for the Q&A for the feature documentary, The Disrupted. My name is Judy Laster. I'm the director of the Woods Hole Film Festival, and this is our 29th Woods Hole Film Festival. Traditionally, the Woods Hole Film Festival is an in-person event that takes place over eight days from the last Saturday of July through the first Saturday of August, actually here in Woods Hole, which is where I am located, right on Water Street. We generally screen about 150 to 180 films. We have five different locations. If you are here tonight on a Friday night, there would be people running up and down the street, getting stuck behind the drawbridge, trying to make it to a screening, but generally having a great time and we would have just this cacophony of creativity for eight days in Woods Hole. But as we all know, in the middle of March, we were, um, uh, not struck with, but the pandemic became obvious and it became clear to us that we were going to need to figure out what we were going to do in response to this pandemic, the word of the pandemic being pivot. So we, along with many of our other colleagues in the film festival world, started to figure out how to uh, present a virtual film festival. And our question was whether or not this was going to be possible to do in such a short period of time, or whether we should push back this year's Woods Hole Film Festival until such time as we could meet in person again. But we decided that uh, we wanted to move forward. We wanted to go with what we are, which is the eight day event in July and August. So we, in the middle of March, beginning of April, uh, started to develop the broad outlines of the first Woods Hole Film Festival virtual edition. So thank you for being part of it. Um, it's been um, an amazing experience putting this together. Um, we've been basically working day and night for the last several months to, because none of the backbone, none of the technology, some of the technology existed, but none of the companies worked in the way that uh, we wanted them to work. And so we feel like we're pioneers in some respects. And we're also thrilled that on this journey, we've had 187 filmmakers join us. Their work is incredible. If you've had a chance to see some of it, I'm sure you agree with me. Um, if not, please get a chance to see it. One of the things we can do because we're virtual is decide to keep things going for a little bit longer. So we've decided to extend the film festival through midnight on Monday, August 3rd. So if you haven't seen the films, you have a chance to keep on watching them. Uh, the other thing is that each film in the festival is eligible for both an audience and a jury award. And so when you're in the platform, you will see five stars next to the beginning of each film, next to the picture of each film. That is where you vote. Please vote. Audience awards matter greatly to the filmmakers. And we hope that you will um, give us the, um, the ability to confer that based on your opinion. The other thing that we could not do this without is the support of our sponsors, our grant funders, and all of the people who are donors and you, the audience, our supporters. Tonight's film is sponsored by Cape Cod Winery. Don't we wish we were sitting out at the vineyard watching this film under the moonlight, drinking some great wine? Well, next year, maybe we will be. Next year, hopefully we'll be in Woods Hole and have a virtual festival as well. So right now I'm gonna bring in um, Sarah Colt and Emily Schumann to talk with us. They are the filmmakers and impact producers of The Disrupted and um, are also alumni of the Woods Hole Film Festival. Um, and that is the one thing that we do really well as well, which is that each year we have about 40 to 50 filmmakers who have been alum alumni, alumnuses, um, of the festival come back and join us with their next work. Um, we are gonna talk for about 20 minutes uh, at that time or even before then, if you would like to type questions in the chat, we will start taking questions. Um, and uh, if you have any issues in particular, um, actually type your questions in the Q and A. If you have any questions about how that works, you can um, uh, type into the chat. Um, with the festival host. So without further ado, please join me, Sarah and Emily. Thank you so much for bringing the disrupted here. 
So my question is, to start off, can you give us sort of a little bit of background about the genesis of this film? Where did it come from? How did you pick the characters? Um, this sort of seems to follow in the interests that you have generally as a filmmaker. I don't know if that's true, but it seems to go along a continuum, so. It does, thank you. Well, um, so just to speak to that in terms of interest as a filmmaker, I actually uh, made a film about the Gilded Age, which was um, for a PBS series called American Experience, and it looked at the period in the late 19th century where um, we had this tremendous wealth growth in this country, we became industrialized, and there were a lot of questions about kind of what kind of a country, what kind of a nation we want to be. And I don't think I totally knew how much I had imbibed from that pro project when I started this one. This project began as the um, project kind of trying to understand better um, from our standpoint in New York City at what had happened during the 2016 election and feeling that we really needed to get outside of our bubble um, in, in Manhattan and on the East Coast and really understand where people were um, in the rest of the country. And we became very interested in um, sort of the populist movement that we see we had seen get behind both Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, and kind of get out into the into the sort of the rest of the country and see what was going on. And we had this interest in industries and what was happening within different uh, jobs, and also in geographies and sort of trying to figure out a way to make a film that would both. Uh, put a spotlight on certain issues that were going on with income inequality, but also to say that we have a lot more in common than we realize, that there's a lot of polarization in our nation right now and have been, has been building for many years, and that by like looking at these three very different people but weaving them together into one story, we could somehow get a much bigger kind of universal story that we um, hopefully achieved with this project, but that was kind of where it all started. So it's possible that uh, people who have joined us may not have seen the film yet. Can uh -huh. you just sort of um, introduce the characters? Of course, yeah. So we ended, we, in the film, we follow three Americans. Um, one is um, a farmer, a fifth generation farmer in uh, Kansas. Um, and he uh, is also an advocate for small family farms. He's fighting to keep his own farm, but he's also fighting for the, the rights of small farmers across the country um, and goes to Washington and to, and to the capital in Kansas to, to advocate for farmers. Um, we followed a former manufacturing worker um, named Agapito uh, Pete Velez. Um, he calls, he's called Pete by um, people outside of his family. And uh, he was, the first day we started filming with him, he was being laid off from a factory job that he had had for 12 years. And we followed him, sort of what was his journey after losing his union job. Um, and then we followed a former mor mortgage processor um, named Cheryl Long, who um, was in Tampa, Florida. And she had been an early adopter of the gig economy and had been driving for Uber and Lyft right from the very beginning when they first came to, to Tampa. And she was also organizing workers and trying to figure out how to get better um, uh, pay and better treatment by these large corporations that they were, you know, working for. So those are the three stories, the three people that we followed. We followed them for two years. So Emily, I'm just going to bring you into the conversation here. Sure. One of the things, so in this festival this year, we actually have a number of films that seem to touch on the similar stories, kind of same subject, which is displacement, disruption, income inequality, but also sort of a way of framing people's lives as, oh, things used to be so great, things aren't so great now. Um, where are they gonna go? What's gonna happen to them? Not only that, but also we as a country, like how do we think about this? And so, when you roll out a film like this, um, part of what you think about is what's the impact of this film going to be when we roll it out? And what is this story going to tell us and move the needle on with regard to the issues that are brought up in the film? And so as you think about an impact uh, campaign or strategy for this film, how do, how do you put that all together? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, well, it's it's kind of funny. We we had a hard time coming up with a title for this film. And uh, Josh Gleason, who's the co-director, um, he came up with The Disrupted. And this was all before we were in a global pandemic. And it couldn't be more on point with everything that's going on. We're all disrupted. And I think, you know, when we were making the film, we felt like these were specialized stories and they, you know, they're middle-class Americans, but, you know, maybe things could have been different for them. But now we connect to all of the subjects, Don, Charles, and Pete in a very human way because we're all disrupted right now. We're at home, we're, you know, not able to work, you know, in some sort of, you know, cases. But I think for, for us, we always wanted to have an impact campaign, even from developing the film, Sarah and Josh talked about getting into communities and connecting with organizations who are, who are instilling real change. And I think when we think about this film, we want people to turn inward and think about what do they want out of their lives? What do they see? Um, what kind of changes do they want to see in, you know, the government and able to have more a more sustainable life so you're not living paycheck to paycheck that maybe health insurance is important to you or employee protection programs um so those are the kind of things that we think about when we're reaching to organizations and having grassroots screenings is you know to start a conversation and you know really think forward to the you know the 2020 election and you know what what are we going to do and, and i'll just I'm sorry no go ahead please well, I would just add to that that I that we always um, had imagined that this was very much um, a film that would get conversations started, and so um, we are trying to part. We are partnering with organizations that are doing work, whether it is to empower people at work and within their workplaces, but also to empower people to to um, work within their communities. So voting is really in, in sort of an important part of our impact campaign, which is to say that people should think about issues that are important to them and make sure that they are going to vote for, for their own community. So in local elections and national elections, um, to use the film as a starting point for conversation that this, these are not, these are individual stories and we hope the film is very intimate and personal, but that there's this universal it, issue that we're talking about, which is that these are not individual problems. They're actually much bigger systemic problems that we need to address as a nation. Well, and, and I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I see this as more of a lyrical kind of documentary, even though it is three separate stories. But, you know, I think the title is so great because it al actually allows you to have sort of different levels of conversation. One is the disruption for the individuals. Two is like this notion now that disruptors in the economy are good, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, and dis people and ways of thinking that disrupt the traditional notion of work, I guess people think that's good. But then you could also say, because of where we are now, the disruption is really our whole system. Our right. whole system has been disrupted. So how, you know, then, how do the individuals function in a disrupted society and a disrupted country when there's no sort of place to get back to specifically? So is it really disruption or is it just fundamental change? And, you know, we're, we're taught, I guess, to sort of think that jobs and careers are gonna be a linear trajectory. And I wonder if in this film, that sort of change your own personal notion of how to think about your own work and your own life. Yeah, I think there's a great line in the film, uh, we need to disrupt the disruptors. And I think, um, you know, in, in our work in film, especially as independent filmmakers, we, you know, we're working for um, not only the film, but in service of the subjects. And I think that you know, throughout making this film, Sarah and Josh and I, we felt like, you know, they each, Don and and Cheryl especially, they were all trying to work, you know, within their industries in order to help workers' rights or try to create change. So I think, you know, thinking about as a film community, 
what we're doing right now to help independent filmmakers and to create a more sustainable working environment for filmmakers. Um, I don't have the answers for it right now, but I think that that's something that is certainly all in our minds. Sarah, do you want to chime in here at all? Well, I mean, I, what I think is just, uh, I mean, you spoke to this, Judy, when you started talking about the project, but I mean, it is kind of incredible how one day you think you know where, the, where everything stands and the next day, I mean, in this crazy way, we've all globally experienced like things turning upside down. And I think, um, unfortunately, in our country, we're having a harder time responding than, than other countries. And I think that tells us something about our, our sort of where we are as a nation. And I also think it tells us something which is addressed in the film, which is about sort of this individualism that we have. We feel so proud of our individualism in the United States. And it has done great things for us, but it's also um, a complicated kind of legacy if you think that it's just on you all the time. And I, I, I think that for, for me, community is like the sort of thing that we need to be thinking about more and more, which is that we need to all come together. And there's no greater example of that than in a response to a pandemic in terms of, you know, how do we come together to do the right thing for, for the greater good, not just for individuals. It's hard to come together and think about doing things for the greater good, though, when you're trying to figure out how to put food on the table for your family. Right. And you're trying to figure out where you're going to live. I mean, it is hard to do it all, even though many people try and they feel like sometimes they're drawn into activism. And we've seen many films with these amazing people who are forced into activism, whether they want to or not, because they can't keep silent. They, it is affecting them, but it's also affecting the communities that they live in. And, you know, when we think about disruption, like this film focuses on the three people, but the communities that are disrupted, the social fabric starts to fray. Right. And then people feel like they don't have a connection. Right. Um, and so, you know, we talk about work, we talk about um, income inequality. Um, if we accept that disruption is the norm now, how, what is, where does that leave people? You know, if you're somebody who's been working in a factory your whole life, and, and I think, you know, um, this is in the film, how do you change all of a sudden? How do you think of yourself differently right. when you identify as a certain kind of person? Um, right. I, you know, it's, a, it's a, an amazing conversation that the people in the film are having and so when you were trying to sort of put the film together from a, um, an editing standpoint, what, what subjects did you think were important to leave in and what did you leave out? Well, it was a really intense edit and we were incredibly lucky to work with an amazingly talented editor named Lynn True. And I don't think we could have made, there's no way we would have made this film without her. She was, I mean, as is true on most projects, but I just can't tell you how much she brought to this project. We, um, there were lots of things that, of course, as usual, didn't make it into the film. And how you, how we figured that out, I mean, it took a long time. <laughs> That's all I would say. It's like, it was a lot of many, many, many different cuts and versions um, trying to understand both, because we had this really complicated edit between figuring out the individual trajectories for each story, but then how did they complement each other and where did they spark each other and how did you kind of, how, did, how long did you need to stay with one story before you went to find another person? And in the end, we sort of always had known that Cheryl's story was, there was the most kind of in some ways breaking news in her story just because her industry was changing so much during the course of her story but then also she did like she was always driving so there's like this very um there was a like almost less uh variation in what she was doing on the day-to-day -day. and so in some ways for me what I think we achieved is that in some ways she ends up being kind of the conscience of all three of them because she's sort of speaking to what they're all experiencing. And I think just to add on that, I think, you know, all three stories, like their points of connection end up 
being work and family. And I think that's kind of what, and even now it just becomes so much more clear. The, those are the things that are so, become so important to us. It's work and your family. And so you obviously filmed this pre-pandemic. Um, how do you think the film would have been different if you were making it now? I mean, there's, there's a part of me, Judy, that on the, I mean, I feel, initially I felt so relieved that we were finished with the film when this all hit. But on the other hand, it would have been really interesting if we'd still been filming when this happened. I mean, it would have been hard, obviously, but it would have been um, interesting to see, to sort of be there for this ultimate bringing, like this, bringing all three of them together because they would have had the exact shared experience. I mean, it was all happening and, you know, within days of each other, each state was um, struggling in, you know, or handling it in different ways, but struggling at the same time. So um, it's such a good question. Um, I'm not sure which is better. <laughs> it has certainly been difficult to roll out a film during a pandemic. Of course. Now, have all three met each other ever? No. no. Because we had hoped we would have a, you know, a screening where we brought everybody together, but obviously that hasn't been able to happen. Have they seen the film? Yes. Yes. So I was able to show the film to all of them in person in January. So I, I mean, individually, but I went to uh, Florida and Kansas and Ohio and screened with them. What, how did they feel about their stories being revealed in this way? You know, they were all really incredibly uh, gracious and generous in their praise of the project, which was a huge relief. It's, there's not, I mean, it's the most nerve wracking thing to take that kind of responsibility and to convince people to be part of a film and then, you know, live and breathe the film and then have, and then when you show it to them, it's really nerve wracking because, you know, you know that they, they consciously agreed to be part of it, but they really don't know what they're going to get in the end. Um, and uh, they each responded in sort of very much in character and they were incredibly generous in their praise of, of how it all came out. I think the hardest one in some ways for me was screening with Pete and Melissa because they really had a hard time during the course of the filming and especially their son struggled quite a lot. You know, he was in a stage in life that's often a really hard time anyway. Um, but they were very um, philosophical about it, and, and, and I think they really loved the film, which is so gratifying. Yeah, I'm always so impressed um, with, I guess you could call them social issue document documentaries, but I don't even know if that's the right title. But documentaries about people who, you know, we think we know them because of what they are, job title-wise, but, you know, everybody is so complex. And everybody has so many different facets to their identity. But somehow in this country, we've decided that work is going to be an identifying um, label that we're going to put on everyone so we know how to think of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that is the one thing that you do so well in this film, which is really bring to light the, the, the fact that a work label does not fit a person. It might be what you do for a living. It might be how you make your money, but it is not who you are. You might identify with it and feel a closeness to it, but it's really just there for the comfort of other people. And so I think that is kind of a, an amazing thing that happens with all the films in this festival this year that really are looking at communities that we consider to be, you know, salt to the earth American communities or salt to the earth American kinds of jobs, whether it's manufacturing or something like that. But um, did it change your perspective at all about sort of work and what kinds of work people do, sort of the value that people place on work in their own lives? Because I can't imagine, let me follow this up, that these people would feel comfortable just saying, oh great, I'm just gonna live on government subsidies. I don't have to work anymore you know, government cheese, whatever, um, they wouldn't want that any more than most people want that. I mean, I, I think you're, I think that one of the themes in the film is sort of the dignity of work and that work, that work, you know, that people should be paid appropriately for the work that they do because that's part of the dignity, that you should be treated a certain way 
in, in work and with your work and that we have some serious issues in our economy that we need to address so that people, there's one thing about sort of disruption in terms of the economy as being disrupted and, and um, industries change and manufacturing is, the nature of manufacturing is changing, we all know that, but the reality of um, giving people the opportunity to succeed within their work, it, it, it involves both training and what the work itself is, but it's also about how well you're paid and you should, and whether you get health insurance and whether you have benefits. And so these are all crucial issues to kind of middle-class Americans. And um, it feels like we, you know, I mean, I certainly found the experience. I mean, I, the reason I'm a documentary filmmaker is that I love what you've just described, which is that everybody has so many layers and complexities. And so for me to spend time with people and really get to know them through this sort of process of this crazy thing we do in documentary filmmaking is just amazing to understand all those layers. I love that. So Emily, do you think, um, you know, if you were doing sort of the, what we call the traditional impact campaign, where do you think this film would have the greatest impact? Ooh, um, that's a good question. Um, I am uh, a lawyer, by the way. Huh? I said I am a lawyer. I asked. Uh, I think, I mean, we imagine this being, you know, part of union discussions and union halls, but also, you know, among farmers and, you know, advocating for small family farmers. Um, I think that this film, you know, I spent a lot of time in the, you know, the rideshare lot in Tampa, and I, I could, you know, listening to different drivers for two years and just things that they wish that they had, you know, employee protections and now drivers are advocating to get PPE. And, you know, I think that, I think with each industry, there's a real um, opportunity for impact and to start conversations and to organize. And I also, I want to add on that to that because what I, what we really wanted to do with this film was that this, we didn't want to make this a film that was political, that hadn't like I had a, it, 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 the message of this film is that we have so much in common as Americans and that we, whether you're, you know, conservative or liberal or you vote a certain way, you know, every election or you switch every election. It was like, we want people to be able to watch this film and get discussions going about the real issues instead of feeling so divided over kind of phony issues that are created out of, you know, the way our news system is now working. And so we want people to be able to watch this film. And of course, we were looking forward to having these screenings where we'd all be together in a room talking about these issues with facilitators and stuff. But we have some good plans for figuring out virtual screenings um, beyond the festivals that we're going to, which we're so pleased to be at Woods Hole. Um, but, you know, virtual screenings, and then also we may do some drive-in movie theater screenings to just try to in break Uber, in an Uber parking lot somewhere. Sorry, what? In an Uber lot, you should do. Yeah, it. exactly. Uber we lot. should. <laughs> but if you want, to, if you want updates about where we are taking this virtual tour, drive-in tour, you can visit uh, the disruptedfilm.com. We have a partnership page, and you can also follow us along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, the Disrupted Film. Um, so I will take this moment to say, if you have a question. Uh, please ask it in the Q&A. We'll be happy to, to talk about it. But um, what was the biggest surprise making this film as far as like the different, you know, um, areas of work that your subjects had? I mean, did you feel like you went into it knowing farming, knowing manufacturing, knowing the gig economy and came out of it not learning anything? Well, I doubt that. But I would say that, I mean, for me, the gig economy, it was the, the newest sort of job that we were following and um, just really understanding how I didn't have, until we got sort of digging into this, just the crazy number of hours that people are working in order to make enough money, um, how difficult it is to get rides in these really oversaturated markets like Tampa, but like New York City, I mean, um, where I live normally. Uh, and, you know, that was all fascinating. And just this culture in the cell phone lot was a huge eye opener to me. The, you know, the why, you know, everybody waiting around for rides. And um, that was 
you know, an eye opener. Emily, you probably have. For one. me, I think um, Don was the most surprising for me. He broke this stereotype of a farmer that, you know, he's on the hill in Washington wearing a suit and advocating for, you know, small family farms. And that was a huge eye opener for me. Um, I, I did not know that, you know, that there was a farmer's union. So that was amazing. And just learning, you know, being in the auction house with Dawn and just learning how, you know, the cattle market kind of works. That was, that was all such an amazing experience. I just want to say that auctioneer, oh my God. <laughs> impressive, very impressive. He could, you know, he could have done the underscore for the entire farming part of the film. He's amazing. That's a shout out to Kenny Rezac. Okay, it's it's a true talent. Um, yeah. So you know, you just you both sort of just touched on this as well. Although this is a film about individuals, it's also about policy issues and companies and corporate culture. And although you probably could have done a lot more sort of hard hitting examination of the relationship between, let's say these these companies like Uber, which try and classify people who work for them in such a way that they're not employees, uh, or, or uh, for the people on the family farm who then are sort of subsidized sometimes by the federal government when they have losses that happen to be politically convenient to subsidize, but then they're yanked away. Um, sort of how much uh, learning or how much um, how much did you think about the overarching political structure that these people are operating under? A lot. <laughs> there was a lot of research that went into this, um, probably nine months before it even, the film even started, right, Sarah? Yeah, well, we started filming, yeah, six months into the... Um, and and also we I mean we we spent a lot of time talking about what would be the um, the sort of language of the film and how much of the kind of hard hitting sort of information and research would be included and um, you know we, we ended up with where we are with the film and and it was but it took a lot to get to that point. So I noticed though at the end, you know, there's the thing up in the television about Uber or I'm not exactly sure where we are now, even with uh, the farm subsidies, but you know, things are state changing still. Yeah. Have you gotten any updates from the subjects in the film as to what's happening in their lives? We, we have, um, you know, everybody's, you know, Pete work so Pete lives in Ohio. Obviously, if you've watched the film, Pete lives in Ohio, and he had been he was on a new, relatively new job. It wasn't the same job that he had when we finished filming, um, but he was working in restaurants and on their refrigeration, driving all over the state. And he worked about a month into the pandemic, so he was quite nervous because he was, you know, not sure about the safety of what he was doing. Um, and then he did get laid off, so he has been on unemployment um, in Ohio. And then he recently, he and I were in touch about a week ago and he has a new job, which he's really excited about, which is actually a union job. So he's very, very pleased to be taking a union job and getting paid um, better, although not as much as he was getting at 3M, but he'll, he'll much closer and it has a long-term trajectory of doing much better if, if, you know, if it works out. So that's very exciting. Cheryl has been out of work. Um, she didn't feel safe driving under these circumstances. Um, and she was working for a startup that was a new rideshare company and they, you know, the startup couldn't keep going with the pandemic. So she's, um, and she's also in Florida. So right now things are very bad in Florida. And Don, you know, he's got his farm, which she um, is obviously passionate about, but he's also got a sort of a day job, which is advocating for family farmers. So he's the president of the Kansas Farmers Union, which is where he draws a salary. And so his job, he can work remote. He's not doing nearly as much traveling, obviously. So he's doing everything on Zoom, just the way we're doing this tonight. Rather than driving all over the state and going to Washington, he's, you know, at home using Zoom. Do you think, um, so I, I don't know about you guys, but I've 
sort of found it interesting in a strange sort of way how all of a sudden now we elevate people who are willing to work in places uh, that we traditionally sort of take for granted, whether it's the Uber driver or the drugstore or the grocery store, all of a sudden now they're heroes because they're willing to do things that are more risky because of the pandemic, but that were probably always risky in some respects, and we didn't call them heroes then. Um, do you think that there will be a long-term impact of the pandemic that makes people realize the importance of valuing workers, people who work regardless of where they work in a different kind of way? I would be so happy if that were true. I mean, I think that would be great because I, I would also just say that I think that's also about how much we pay people who do those jobs. And so, um, and I don't think we pay them properly. And I think we need to think, you know, there's, there's a real conversation that needs to happen about income inequality and also how much people are paid for their work. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm sure we'll hear more about that as we get deeper into the election season, especially the disparity between the rich and the poor in this country. But um, again, you know, like let's just say that the notion of a minimum income was brought into this discussion with these folks. I don't even think they would necessarily agree with that, but maybe they would. It seemed like they're, they're happier making their money as opposed to being guaranteed a certain amount of money. Maybe that's not true. It's a good question. I think, you know, there's a point in the film where I think um, it's one of my favorite parts where Cheryl just, she says, um, you know, I just need to make what I need to survive. Uh, I don't want more, just what I need. And I think that's true for all of the subjects. They want time with their family, they want dignity for their work, and they want to make enough money to, you know, be comfortable. Yeah, do you, do we, are either of you sort of inspired to get more involved with the issues that are, that have come out in this film, outside of the film? It's such, it's such a good question. You know, my, most of my career I've worked for um, PBS and WGBH where um, being journalistic in your approach and kind of not having an opinion, you know, supposedly not having an opinion is so important. And I feel like this film is, you know, we approached it as really wanting it to be kind of like a nonpartisan film. But I, clearly you can tell from the way I'm talking that I really do think that we have a problem and that we need to deal with it. You know, that we, it's 30, 40 years in the making, this, this rise of income inequality. and um, it's not helping, I don't think. And so I feel very passionate about it. Um, I'm not sure, right now what I'm doing is trying to get this film out into the whole world. So that's my, that's my job. But um, I feel like beyond the film, I'm not sure what would be next, but maybe it's my next film. Make the film about yourself. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Definitely not. Why not? Transformations. Um, we have time for one last question, if anybody wants to chime in here, otherwise I'll sort of ask it. Um, so as filmmakers, you know, you just sort of mentioned this, you're supposed to be the uh, even nonpartisan, non-opinionated camera person who's telling the story, but you're not inserting your own self into the story. Do you feel like that's changing in some respects now in terms of the documentary film world? that especially now people feel more free to actually have an opinion that comes out in a film? I think it depends on the film, but I think um, certainly people feel like, you know, that they could have a point of view and that you can show, um, you know, both sides or multiple sides and, you know, s still have your take on, um, on the subject. I think, you know, for this film, because we really wanted to engage people and start a conversation. I think it was really important to, um, to not, make, not make the film divided and um, just have a clear voice and a consensus. 
I mean, I think what's exciting, Judy, is the fact that um, in the past, there was a lot of talk of be being objective, but the people who were making the films were all from one perspective. So what's exciting to me is that in the course of my career so far, you know, and I hope that this is going to be much more true going forward, is that the, the voices and the opening up to who's telling stories is changing and finally, thank, thankfully. And so I think that will, that just makes everybody more honest about this whole notion of objectivity. Absolutely. Well, I know we could have a much longer discussion, but unfortunately our time is coming to a close. So I'm just going to remind people this film is eligible for an audience award. Please vote in the platform um, and at the festival is uh, still on through Monday, August 3rd. Maybe you'll go to the Cape Cod Winery or the restaurants that are supporting the Woods Hole Film Festival, get some wine and food, bring it home, watch some great films. Um, thank you to Sarah, thank you to Emily. You've made a fantastic film. I know that when it gets out into the world, it's going to engender much conversation, whether or not it's a virtual or at a drive-in. Um, be hard to have a conversation at a drive-in unless everybody had a microphone in their car though <laughs> but best of luck and thank you so much have a well, great thanks. evening thanks for having us at the woods hole film festival we're thrilled to be here Absolutely. thank you thanks judy good night good night good night